Welcome to Bible 180, Isaiah. Isaiah was the divinely ordained court advisor to the kings of Jerusalem. He advised at least four kings, including the good, the bad, and the ugly. Isaiah describes Yahweh as the true king of the universe, contrasted by the arrogant and foolish kings of his time. In chapter 1, Yahweh brings a legal case against Israel who have heinously violated the generous covenant that God made with them at Sinai. Chapter 5 describes Israel as a fruitless vineyard and Yahweh as the frustrated but faithful gardener. Chapters 2 through 5 talk about Israel's unfaithfulness and judgment, but also predict a day when Yahweh will be universally revered and worshipped. Then Isaiah is brought before the heavenly courtroom of God. Isaiah thinks he's doomed, for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet Yahweh forgives him and commissions him to be his messenger. In chapter 7, Yahweh warns Ahaz against relying on Egypt instead of Yahweh, which is like returning to slavery. David's descendants are just as bad as the pagan kings. Nevertheless, there are wonderful promises to this spiritually bankrupt house of David, bereft of any real leadership. For a great prince will come from them, a prince of peace, the Messiah born of a young maiden, God with us, who will bring rescue and salvation of God's people. The middle chapters describe God's judgment of the nations. Both Israel and Judah are involved. Assyria and Babylon, ancient superpowers, will temporarily threaten or even subjugate Judah, but it becomes clear that God is orchestrating both their rise and their demise. In chapter 40, Isaiah prophesies that all men are like grass or flowers that don't last, but the word of the Lord stands forever. There's proof earlier in the book as the most powerful men in the world are thwarted by Yahweh's plans. God's power is a reoccurring theme. Yahweh pokes fun at the flimsy nature of idols and the futility of trusting in them. One sign that he's real is that he actually punishes when his people disobey, but also that he saves them. There's lots of clear and uncompromising condemnation. Yahweh lays bare the treachery and the unfaithfulness of his people, yet Yahweh promises he will forever restore and forgive his people, never to punish them again. Often he pivots in ankle-breaking fashion from judgment to the promises of forgiveness, restoration, and true leadership. Yahweh unveils how he really feels about things, including his description of what he wants from his people, not fasting or sacrifice, but rather loosing the chains of injustice, giving food to the hungry or clothing the naked, also honoring God by seeking his help and worshiping him as the true God and Savior. A character shrouded in mystery begins to take shape in the second half of Isaiah, the servant of Yahweh. Israel was supposed to be God's servant, but this new servant seems seems to be Israel, yet a better and more faithful version or a microcosm of Israel. This servant will bring about healing and peace and will be faithful to Yahweh's will and plan, bring victory, and will draw all the nations, not just the Israelites, to a true and right worship of Yahweh, which not even the Israelites were doing. This servant and savior will be the key, the shoot to arise from Jesse's stump and rescue God's people and the world from the sad state that God's people have found themselves in.